Hello, everyone. Waiting for everybody to get in. Anybody have any questions before we get started? I finally put up our homework and our syllabus, and I know I left off a few things on the syllabus, but I got to work out some details, of course. I've been thinking a lot about what uh, Eminem character I want to hurt. <laughs> um, I have a question. I have a question about the homework. Okay. Um, so you have it like posted, but are you going to make it like available when we're closer to being done with the chapter? Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's uh, I got to change the due dates, but the due date is going to be uh, not this Sunday, but next at eleven fifty nine p.m. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? <coughs> you said you've been smoking, so I got a reason to post. <laughs> what was that, Chloe? <laughs> you said you were thinking a lot about which M and M. Which one is it? <laughs> I, I'm still leaning towards uh, possibly red. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> okay. I've been thinking a lot about the Princess Bride as well, and some other old school stuff. B O O H O O from Breakfast Club. <laughs> I still haven't uh, watched The Princess Bride. I've been meaning to, but I just haven't found the time. Oh, it's great. It, it really is good. It's really beautiful. Um, I know they have it on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Evidently, Ted Cruz, which is like the least likely person I'd think that would like it, loves it. I don't have Disney+, Plus, so like, I think I'll have to like rent it on YouTube. Because yeah. I don't, I don't want to pay that much money for Disney Plus when I'm already paying for like Netflix and Hulu. So, yeah, I get you. I, I quit my Hulu. There wasn't as much into that, but uh, uh, I like, I definitely like Disney Plus better than Hulu, and I'm approaching the point where I like Disney Plus better than I do Netflix. But uh, just because the Cosmo series is on there, which is amazing. Does uh, does Disney not have a uh, free subscription? Uh, yes, uh, Disney has a, I think it's $6.96, which is quite a bit cheaper than Netflix. Uh, or, also, also Verizon, if you sign up with Verizon, they'll give you one for a year. You know, I didn't know that. I have Verizon. I'll have to like figure that out. Yeah, you can probably call them. They'll give you a year. And if, if they don't, you know, get a little cocky with them. Say, well, I think I'm going to go to another uh cell phone company if you can't you know give me the same deal you're giving a new person you'd be surprised how uh, if you're you know sort of forceful but not mean but just polite then you'll be surprised what you get no hulu has a student plan where it's like 199 a month oh awesome that's cool who does hulu hulu cool that is a lot cheaper yeah, also, yeah, go ahead melvin oh i was paying like yeah paying 99 cents for like hulu and spotify awesome for student being a student I wish I, I knew Spotify. I wish I knew this stuff beforehand before I went and like purchased the whole Hulu package because I'm just like sitting here paying like eleven dollars a month and I had no idea about the student package. I also yeah, tell you that a, a scurrilous faculty member I used to know at not at TCC at another school and I, I literally mean he was he was a little sh uh, sketchy or shifty if you will. Uh, <laughs> He would repeatedly sign up for subscriptions with new emails. So he'd get like two or three months free of various magazines. And then when that ran out, he'd create a new email and do it again. That's you should do, do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do that for Netflix. Or I heard they ended it, but I used to do that for Netflix. I've done that once, uh, but not like just to, it was mainly because I wanted a specific copy of a magazine because it had a specific article in it that I wanted. It was like Esquire or something that I would never read. Uh, but I did that and then I forgot to turn it off. So it charged me nine ninety nine, and then I, I went back and canceled it. So <laughs> I do that with like um, political articles who are like, oh, you have to subscribe in order to like read the rest of this. And I'm like, uh, you got a free subscription base. So I'm just gonna yeah. <laughs> make a fake email. <laughs> It, if you're you interested just, uh, like in Washington Post or the New York Times and probably even the New York Post and some of those other ones, uh, I know Washington Post and the New York Times both give a discount for education. So I think I pay twelve ninety nine a year for the Washington Post and something similar for the New York Times. 
So, uh, and that's all electronic. It comes straight to your phone. You just got to put in your password and all that stuff. They've got apps for it and everything. So that's another nice source of news. Uh, both of those cover actual astronomy and, and science stories. So I highly recommend it. Well, I guess this is all we're getting right now. So I guess I'll go ahead and jump in to start covering the material. Does anybody have any? Oh, someone's got a serious microphone. Chris there, rock on. And a Guinness shirt. I love it. Can't stand Guinness. I've, I've tried to like it, but I just, just can't uh, get there. Uh, Madison's got some paint painting back there in the background. What is that? Oh, flowers. Excellent. Yeah. Actually, our friend painted it. So, oh, cool. yeah, I like it. I actually uh, do a little art on the side. I'm a big Georgia O'Keeffe fan, so I painted a lot of flowers, but actually I do more with seashells, but I do the sort of same thing that uh, O'Keeffe does where they look like, you know, different parts, <laughs> but not in the gross provocative way, just in that I love Georgia O'Keeffe way. <laughs> All right, well, let's get cracking on this. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is something, it's a, uh, it's a PowerPoint I made up called a self-addressed envelope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about, imagine you had a pen pal. So this is a very antiquated thing, which wasn't even a thing when I was in, in school. Uh, but it's a thing where people used to just meet pen pals at any part of the world, and you could write them a letter but they didn't necessarily know how to address the envelope to mail back to you. So you would write them a letter and you would enclose the envelope with your address on it so that it could get to uh, your address from their location in China or wherever. Uh, so what we're going to do is do that only we're going to imagine a pen pal that might in fact be in another universe, not just another galaxy, not just another solar system, which is called a star system. Uh, by doing this, it allows you to see the levels of hierarchy of how big things are. You know, people often make the mistake of confusing a universe with a galaxy and a solar system with a galaxy. So this will help you work out that. But it also shows you some of the key things that we'll use in astronomy throughout the semester. Uh, for instance, we're going to use scientific notation and occasionally in the homeworks, uh, you're going to use convert back and forth between scientific notation and regular notation. And you'll maybe even convert a unit or two. Uh, again, in the homeworks, I usually avoid that math in the actual test. The only math you'll use in uh, astronomy for me is velocity equals frequency times wavelength. That's one equation. I even show you a way of doing it without algebra. Another one is uh, distance equals one over the parallax angle, or parallax angle equals one over the distance, they're the same equation. And then uh, I think that's basically it. Let me see if I can think of another. Oh yeah, Kepler's third law we occasionally use, and that's the square of the period is equal to the cube of the semi major axis, assuming you use astronomical units and years for the units. Uh, so those are the three, only the three equations that I ever test you on. Uh, the rest, we're going to use things like thumbs up, thumbs up, or thumbs up, thumbs down. What I mean by that is, uh, for instance, I suspect you all know uh, that the more calories you take in, the more likely you are to be heavy. So you'd say weight and calorie intake are thumbs up, thumbs up. Whereas if you said uh, your weight is uh, related to the amount of calories you ex uh, expend in doing your workouts, then you'd say your weight is inversely related, thumbs up, thumbs down, if you will, uh, to calories expelled or burnt, okay? Uh, and what that means mathematically is just in the case of thumbs up, thumbs up, it's one is equal to a constant times the other. So weight is equal to some constant times uh, calorie intake. Uh, the other one would mean uh, weight is equal to some constant divided by the calories burned. So that's what thumbs up, thumbs down mean. And then you can also add things like, you know, instead of them being just one to one, you know, weight to mass, it might be or weight to calories, it might be weight to calories squared, or weight to calories burnt squared in the bottom. So we'll deal with those type things just by that thumbs up, thumbs down thing and, and understanding how they work. So you don't actually have to plug in, for instance, a gravitational constant to, to work out Newton's law of gravity. So that's the way I'm going to try to keep it throughout the whole semester, uh, just so you guys can get some of the awesomeness of mathematics, but without some of the scary algebra that a lot of people are just scared of. And, and really, once you get a I mean, I, I did horribly through school. I had to take three math classes my senior year in high school because I failed like every year and went to summer school every year. Uh, but 
my senior year, I discovered something interesting about math. And next thing you know, it became really easy. So even if you think you are horrible at math and you hate it, you might be surprised, you know, two, three weeks, two, three years, you might find yourself really immersed in it and love it. So, all right, well, let me start by sharing my screen. And I'm going to go back and forth between sharing my screen and sharing a document cam if I need to write anything. So first off, I'm going to go to this PowerPoint, and it's called a self-addressed envelope. Uh, that is actually on uh, that's actually on the uh, Canvas page, so you can definitely catch it there if you would like. Uh, I'm going to now make this full page. I think by doing this, we'll see. Maybe not. Maybe not at all. Let's see. Nope. You can okay. double click it. That's what I'm trying to do. It's not doing it for some reason. Okay, let me see. View. I, I, part of my Zoom icons are covering up what I usually use. So let me see if it's. Try to go to page, pages down to the book. Uh, bottom yes. of the screen. Yeah, that's the problem. I can't see it because of stupid Zoom oh. things in the way. Oh, there it is. You can okay, move gotcha. it. <laughs> <laughs> a stupid zoom thing i knew where it was but i couldn't find it <laughs> all right y'all see the whole screen now right so this is called a self-addressed envelope in this presentation you will start from a mundane earthly scale and increase the field of view by a factor of 100 so every time we're going to back up so the whatever we see for the first width and height of a, of a camera we're going to back that up by a factor of 100 and that'll be one step and then another hundred and that'll be another step in doing so you will learn parts of your universe so that you can uh, have a pen pal in an alternate universe and gain a sense of scale so this also gives you a sense of scale and i'm going to probably blow your mind because i get goosebumps every time i do this lecture so it's really awesome i hope you like it so this is basically i ended up doing a google earth view but this is a port discover it's a hands-on science museum that i create uh, or that i was a part of the uh, founding board that created in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. It's a small town. They don't have a, a lot of uh, science related stuff. So it was a really good in, uh, area to go into. And this is that scene from Google Earth because I didn't have time to drive over there and take a picture from the roof. But I made sure I cropped it to about 52.8 feet. Uh, Y'all might even recognize what that is. And another thing is that 52.8 feet also happens to be about 16 meters, okay? 16 meters is about 15 point, uh, 52.8 feet. And that's sort of starting to show you that, hey, we're in a science class. We're not going to be using feet anymore. We're going to be using uh, the what you call the metric system or the system international, which is a, a series of, of comprehensive, knowledgeable, knowledge based uh, units where you go up by factors of 10. So a meter is the base unit, for instance, of length. And you could go up by a factor of 10 and call that a decameter. You go up by another factor of 10, that would be called a hectometer. You go up by another factor of 10, that's a kilometer. Then you jump by a factor of 1,000, that's a megameter. And then you jump by another factor of 1,000, that's a gigameter, and another is a terameter. If you want to go down, you go down by a factor of 10 from the uh, meter, and you'll get a decimeter. If you go down by a factor of 10 again, that's a, that's a hundredth, that's a centimeter, just like there's 100 cents in a dollar. Also, that's also called a, a, a sonometer, by the way, which is uh, for anybody that's had a baby, they probably know about that one. Uh, if you go down another factor of 100, that's 1,000th, that's a millimeter or a millimeter. Another factor, this time you jump to 1,000, that's a micrometer. Another 1,000 is a nanometer and another 1,000 is a picometer. And they keep going the other ways, but that's a much more sensible unit than like, you know, a cup is made up of eight ounces and two cups make a pint and two pints make a quart and four quarts make a gallon. You know, it's a historical system unit. So that's why we're using this. Uh, does anybody recognize what 52.8 would be? Maybe if you multiply it by say 100. 52.8 feet. Anybody? Uh, a mile. Exactly. So that's that's why I use that unit. So you'd see the next thing would jump up to a mile uh, because that's a good, reasonable amount of uh, a unit that people can picture. So let's look at the ne next scene. That's actually what Port Discover looks like. Uh, that sign I actually put in there with a little photoshopping. Uh, that is the sign that they have. It just didn't look that cool in, in it. So I did it myself. Uh, but this is the street view of what you were looking at from above. Uh, now I'm going to jump up by a factor of 100. 
And notice at this scale, so that's one jump of 100. One jump of 100, I've switched to basically a one mile by one mile square roughly, okay? You can very much see evidence of humans. You can see streets and buildings and bridges, and uh, you can see evidence of absence of humans. You see open uh, forests and things like that. Uh, but this is actually Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, that little bridge on the right is the bridge from Camden into Elizabeth City. Uh, and I did that again because Port Discover is a place that's dear to my heart. Uh, and I live pretty close to it. And I used to live there. And that's also the, where the community college I used to teach at is. Uh, so I've always had some kind of tie to that. And being from Currituck, it's only you know, 25 minutes down the road. So at one jump up, we went to one mile or 1.6 kilometers. So that also gives you a rough estimate of the conversion factor between a mile and a kilometer. It's about one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. If I jump up another factor of 10, then now I'm at 10 miles, I mean a factor of 100, excuse me, uh, <laughs> then I'm supposed to be at 100 miles. I don't know why I, I said 10 there. Uh, anyways, let me check that again. Yeah, that was one mile, so this one should be 100 miles. Uh, I'll have to remember to fix that. I've taught this twice, and this is the first time I noticed that was off. Uh, so yeah, this is 100 miles by 100 miles. At this point, you can see some impact of humans. And you can see the absence of humans. Like you see this big green area here is the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, this is uh, actually Tidewater area. So Portsmouth is over here and Norfolk's over there, Virginia Beach there. This is the uh, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, the Eastern Shore. Uh, so at a hundred miles, not 10 miles, uh, we're at two jumps and that's what we're seeing. I'm gonna go ahead and put the boundaries on it so it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, you can see, like I said, Portsmouth is over here, Norfolk's over here, Virginia Beach, uh, Chesapeake, Suffolk, uh, the Netherlands of Elizabeth City, and here's Currituck all along here, and including some of this over here on the, on the coastline, excuse me, all this along here, that's Camden, sorry. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, again, at two factors of 100, what we get to look at. If I jump another one, so this is just three jumps of 100, I now have an area that's bigger than the size of the Earth. Earth's diameter is about, uh, well, y'all can read it down there at the bottom, it's about 12,800 kilometers or miles, if I remember correctly. I, I can't see it because my stupid, uh, there it is, okay, my st stupid Zoom thing's in the way. Anyways, but I did find a way. Yeah, about 12,800 kilometers across is about the size of the Earth's diameter. Uh, and the picture is about 1,600 kilometers. Does that picture look a little funny to you? That doesn't look like Earth very much, does it? Well, the reason why I bring that up, again, at three jumps, we're up to about 10,000 miles. The reason I bring that up is that's one of the things that we do in astronomy. We don't just use visible light anymore. In fact, we use the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which is gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. This one happens to be in the uh, near infrared. So that's another thing that astronomy uh, allows you to do is start looking because astronomers are sort of like a, a starving animal. They're gonna suck every bit of marrow out of a bone they find. And that's the way astronomers are. We're, we're literally looking uh, to find every bit of information we can out of any evidence we have. So we have to break light up into many wavelengths and get a lot more information just than looking at visible light. So this was taken by NASA in the near infrared. Here's a regular fo uh, photo taken by NASA and that's in the visible light. So if we jump up another factor of 100, then we're up four total and we're at 1.6 million kilometers, okay? 1.6 million kilometers. Now in that size, you can see it's actually quite a bit bigger than the orbit of the moon around the earth. The orbit of the moon around the earth is quite big. For instance, it takes light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, uh, just a little bit uh, more than a second to get from us, uh, get from the moon to us. So that gives you some kind of perspective, but you start to see how cumbersome numbers like one six zero 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 are, and in fact, if you put it in meters instead of kilometers, meters being the unit that we that I normally use as opposed to kilometers, then it'd be one six zero 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 zero. So that's kind of a, a nasty number. So we're gonna deal with that with something called scientific notation. Not only is it cumbersome, but we know for a fact that the digits following that six are not all zeros. So it's actually inaccurate as well. 
Uh, I didn't take the time to look up all those digits. So I'm actually reporting a lie to you by saying it's 1.6 with all those zeros. So the better way would be writing it in scientific notation. So uh, how do we take care of that? Well, let me show you real quick. I'm gonna stop share for a second and I'm gonna show you my camera. So it turns out if you have 1,600,000 kilometers, right? That's also 1,600,000,000 meters. Okay, so that's the same number I just wrote except now I'm using meters. Uh, what I can do is realize, hey, I need this part of the number, the part that I really know, which is just a one and a six. I want that between one and 10. It can be as big as, I mean, as small as one, but it can't be as big as 10. So if I put the decimal place there, it'd be too small. It's smaller than one. If I put the decimal place there, it'd be too big. It's bigger than 10. But if I put the decimal place there, it'd be exactly right. So I'm going to write this as 1.6 times something. Now here's the trick. What you realize is when you multiply by 10, you just add a zero to the end. That's the same thing as moving the decimal one place to the right. So if I took uh, $5 and said, I'm gonna give you 10 times as much money, you probably like all of a sudden become Rain Man and say, oh, you're gonna give me $50. <laughs> because you know immediately when I multiply by 10, you move, you add one decimal to the end, right? So what we gotta do is say, hey, how many times do I have to move this decimal to get to where the decimal actually is? So I can see it's one, two, three. Notice I'm counting the moves, not the, not the places. So it's, I've moved it one move, two moves, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I moved it to the right. So that's multiplying by 10 as opposed to dividing. So I'd put a plus nine up here and you don't actually have to write the plus. I just wanted to reiterate that it is plus. So that's 1.6 times 10 to the ninth meters. If on the other hand, you had a really small number like 0, 0.000, notice I'm gonna group it in pods of three from either side will be fine just so it's easy for us to read. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 6, 6, 7. I'll leave the units off of this one. That happens to be the gravitational constant of the universe from Newton's law. But in this case, uh, can I put the decimal there? Would that be right? No, how about there? No, how about there? Yeah, so that'd be acceptable, right? So I'm gonna write this number as 6.67. Now, this time I realize I gotta move the decimal to the left, so I'm gonna say times 10 to the negative because a negative means divide by, basically. When you put a negative exponent on something, you flip it over. So you take it from the numerator of the fraction and put it in the denominator, so it's really dividing. So I'm gonna put a 10 to the negative power on this case. Now I just count how many places I have to move it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So times ten to the negative eleventh, and that's the way we do that. I didn't give you the units because they're really ugly, but they're newtons meter squared per, uh, or excuse me, newton meter squared per kilogram squared. That's really what the unit is. So that's the way you switch from regular notation to scientific notation. If on the other hand, you had 1.00 times 10 to the fifth, you say, hey, wait, that's positive. So I know that's a big number. So I know I'm gonna move the decimal to the right. So positive implies right. So I'm gonna write one, zero, zero, and I gotta move the decimal five places. So I'll say one, two, again, notice I'm counting the moves, three, four, five. So now I just fill in a zero, fill in a zero, fill in a zero, and the decimal is there. So this number is in fact 100,000. Okay. Now let me give you some appreciation for why the scientific notation is so great. Uh, let's do uh, the, the mass of a proton, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. That's the mass of a proton. That's a very, very, very small number. So what we know is I'm gonna have a one, six, seven way over here and a kilogram. But I gotta move this decimal, which is right here. I've gotta move it to the left because right is positive and left is negative. I gotta move it to the left 27 times. 
So I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So what I was trying to do is group those in pods of three. That's why they were different sizes each time. Okay, so that's it. Notice that number is a zero followed by a decimal point followed by 26 zeros and then a 167. So that's, that's the reason that we use scientific notation. One, it can be inaccurate if you don't because you're suggesting I know all these numbers are zeros when I only know that the one and the six are real, right? And two, it's just a mess and just begging to make a mistake. So that's scientific notation. Now let me stop this and go back to uh sharing my screen so that's how we fix the scientific notate or fix the problem of uh too big a numbers we use scientific notation if i jump up our fifth this is our fifth uh jump now this is a five jumps of 100 times each we're now bigger than the distance between the earth and the sun the average distance that distance is called an astronomical unit as given the symbol AU. And that number is 1.496 times 10 to the eight, which is kilometers is what your book's using, but I'm telling you guys to use meters, okay? Uh, when we use velocity equals frequency times wavelength, kilometers are gonna jack you up. So uh, just think of it this way. So this is another thing astronomers do. They try to make units that are, are, are more reasonable. Like if you're dealing with things inside of our solar system, you don't wanna deal with centimeters, right? You don't even want to deal with meters or kilometers. In fact, you've got uh, 149.6 million kilometers from the Earth to the sun. So that's ugly. You don't want to deal with that. So they said, oh, let's, let's call that distance one because, wow, I really like one. It's an easy number. Uh, and this is also because in the history of astronomy, we didn't initially know that distance. So they would call it like A. And then they could figure out, you know, that the distance to Venus is like, like point uh 6a and the distance to mercury would be like 0.2a or something so they could keep it all in terms of that a and then ultimately when they figured it out the ancient greeks were able to do this by the way uh when they figured it out then they could go ahead and figure out what a is but that's another thing we do we don't only use scientific notation we use convenient units one of the convenient units is the astronomical unit another one my star trek and star uh wars fans might know there's actually two of them. One starts with an L and another starts with a P. Anybody? Anybody? Leia is and Padme? One... Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, parsec? it's uh, the Parsec. Parsec, uh, yeah. Ah. Uh, remember, they did a castle run and something Parsecs, which is really bad because uh, George screwed up on uh, knowing that a Parsec is a unit of distance instead of time. He thought it was, a, since it ends in sec, like second, he thought it was a unit of, dist of time. Uh, but Parsec is the one, yeah, I was shooting for, and I couldn't make out what you had said. Uh, the other one is, starts with an L. Sounds like a unit of time, too. Light year. The light year, yes, exactly. So that's another unit that we'll use, and uh, I'll even show you how to work that out in a little while. So uh, we jump up six and now we've actually got a hundred astronomical units square. And that's enough for us to, uh, to include the orbit of Pluto, uh, which is of course no longer a planet. We'll discuss that. Uh, well, not in 132, but 131, you discuss that. But basically the planets are going from the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then there's an asteroid belt. But notice on this scale, uh, the size of the, picture is so large that we can't even tell, uh, we can't even see the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, uh, and that's just because it's teeny. Uh, but then there's a big gap between Mars and Jupiter. In that gap is the asteroid belt. Then it's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, <laughs> 
which I can't say without giggling because I'm still in third grade, uh, which, by the way, does have a, uh, a orbit that crosses the orbit, uh, or excuse me, not Uranus. Uranus is there, and then Neptune has an orbit that crosses the orbit of, Pl of Pluto, but they're in a synchronous orbit, so they're never going to be at the same place at the same time, so we don't have to worry about them colliding. Uh, Pluto doesn't really fit, though, because it turns out those inner planets are sort of rocky. You know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are sort of rocky, and then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are giant and gassy, and they have, a, you know, rings. They all have rings. They all have moons, lots and lots of moons. The inner planets don't have very many moons. The Earth has one, and it has several man-made satellites. Uh, 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 Mars has a couple. Uh, Mercury doesn't have one. Uh, so that's a, a rarity, whereas the outer planets have a lot. In fact, the last count I heard for Jupiter was over 98 moons. So it's got a lot, and they all have rings. And then you get to Pluto, and it's neither big nor gassy. In fact, it's more like a, you know, that, that wad of snow you get in your wheel well of your car after you've been driving in a crappy weather storm, a uh, winter storm. That's what Pluto is. It's like dirty snow. In fact, it's much more like a what we call a Kuiper Belt object, which is what you see out here. And this Kuiper Belt is basically what we call cometous or comet-like material, whereas the inner one was asteroids. And notice asteroid has an R in it, so you can think of it as a rock. And comet has a C in it, so you can think of it as ice. And that's sort of what it is. But sure enough, as soon as we did some experiments and actually, you know, captured parts of an asteroid, we found out that it had a lot of ice in it. And as soon as we captured parts of a comet, we found it had a lot of rock in it. So th that's not 100% true. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but now we got that Kuiper belt. And that Kuiper belt's like a donut. Uh, it's not flat. It, it's literally got some uh, height in and out uh, of the screen here. Uh, so it's a little bit thicker. If you look at it from the side, it's a little bit thicker than the planes of our planetary orbits, which are very close to one plane, except for Pluto and, and Mars is a little jacked up as well. So that's at six jumps. We've now enclosed our entire commonly known solar system, but not the whole solar system, because most people don't know about this next thing called the Oort cloud. Uh, the Oort cloud uh, was predicted by a guy by the name of Jan Oort who realized that, you know, when stuff comes into the inner atmosphere or the inner solar system, the inner star system, that's the name of, of on our envelope, by the way, uh, the inner star system, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are really big, so they'd sling them in random directions. And so he predicted that there was these high uh, eccentricity, crazy orbits that go out hundreds of astronomical units, maybe even on the order of a light year away. And those things should all be out there coming in, you know, on the order of every couple hundred thousand years. And that might even be the reason that we have mass extinctions is uh, we know at least one of them or at least two of them uh, mass extinctions were caused by uh, asteroids or comets. So that might actually be an answer to many of them. So at six, we get to see our whole solar system. So again, as far as our envelope goes, we would start off with our street. Well, first, our name, because once you put your house, uh, the only thing left is to signify which person would be there. So when I ask you to do this uh, for like a, a reflection question, you don't have to put in your your street name and that stuff. I, you know, I don't want to stalk y'all or get accused of stalking you guys. But normally it would start with your name because that's the most specific thing. Then your house number, which would be your address on your street. Uh, that's the next most specific. Then the next line would be your city which is the next most specific. And then the next one would be your state. And then the next one would be your country. The next one would probably be planet Earth, or maybe even you do the uh, do the actual continent you're on and then do the planet Earth, or say third rock from the sun, or third rock from the star in the star system. Uh, star system is another line, but in this case, we call it the solar system because we named our sun Solus. So that's how you get the next line would be the solar system. And then the solar system is inside of what? That's the next line we're gonna get. So now that we jumped another factor of 100, that we're up to seven jumps total and seven jumps total gets us to see the Oort cloud, which is sort of that donut that you're seeing on your screen right now. Uh, that's on the order of 2000 to 200,000 astronomical units away. Okay, uh, that is a large distance. And notice there's no other stars. Even though we jumped up seven times, we haven't gotten to the nearest star. So that really gives you an appreciation for how uh, small our planet and solar system is compared to the distance between the stars. Even though this is a fairly 
highly packed area of the universe, it's essentially empty. You know, it's like, uh, honey, I shrunk the kids. He said matters, you know, mostly empty space. And he's right about that uh, in the t sense of atoms, but he's also right about that in the sense of the universe. Mr. So let Younger. me stop sharing a second. And I want to give you some information because we just jumped to 200,000 astronomical units. That's pretty big. Uh, what I tell you is that one astronomical unit, and remember I use meters. So I'm going to say that's, well, oh, I'm, talking to you on the camera while I'm writing to you on the on the page that you're not looking at. That's not helpful at all. I think someone about, had a question. Oh, go for it. What's your question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could like explain exactly like what the Oort cloud is, like just okay. in simple terms. So uh, one thing to know is the Oort cloud and the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt are sort of similar things. Uh, the asteroid belt's like a, a donut. It, let me get back to showing you the camera so I can talk with my hands. <laughs> so, uh, if you imagine just in between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter is sort of this donut like this, and it's got a bunch of rocks. And what's going on there is Jupiter is so close to the, uh, to the asteroid belt that if any moon tried to form there, Jupiter would rip it apart. And that's called the Roche limit. So a lot of things ended up there that would have possibly been other planets, but because Jupiter is so massive, it, it didn't allow a lot of them to form. And that is basically a, a collection of rocks that's nowhere near as, as packed as you see in Star Wars and Star Trek movies. Asteroid belts are, you know, you'd be lucky to see two of them as you go through it, you know. Uh, but it's, it's basically asteroids, rocky things mostly, but some of them are even the size of planets, uh, orbiting around in the same general direction as the planets are orbiting. The Kuiper belt is just outside of the orbit of uh, Pluto, and actually Pluto runs through it a little bit, which is why it's lost its planet uh, designation. And that, again, is another donut of icy-type cometous things, some of which, again, are as big as our moon and big as planets, okay? Uh, but they're also orbiting. That's the key thing. People sort of think of them as just sitting there. Well, they couldn't sit there or else they'd fall into the, into the sun. The Oort cloud is different. The Oort cloud is this giant uh, sphere where things are not on, they're not like the Oort or the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt in that all those things are roughly orbiting in the same size. The things in the Oort cloud are actually transient. They're, they're orbiting too, but some of them actually come all the way from the Oort cloud, which is 200,000 light years away, in by the sun and then rush back out. So they're going this way, that way, all that stuff. That's what the Oort cloud is. Uh, and it was predicted and, you know, every now and then we get a surprise where an asteroid comes through and, a, you know, a bunch of buildings lose their windows in, in Russia or United States on occasion that happens. Uh, Russia's a big landmass. That's why they had, for instance, the Tunguska event, uh, which was around the night, early 1900s. It just exploded in the middle of the night out in the uh, Siberia area and leveled uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of land just leveled the trees, burn them all down, killed wildlife and everything. And what it was was we think a comet because there's no real rocky debris left, but it exploded probably before it hit the earth because there's no crater there and leveled everything. So it's like a, a huge nuclear weapon went off. And that would have been probably an Oort cloud object that is in such a large elliptic orbit that it comes in near our solar system, uh, near our planets, our sun and stuff like that. And that one got so close that it actually exploded in our atmosphere. Does that make sense, Natalie? I think that was who asked. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. No problem. All right. So now let me go back to the camera view. So one astronomical unit, again, I'm using the units of meters. So that's 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. Notice they normally, like your book will say, 1.496 times 10 to the 8th kilometers but a kilometer is a thousand meters. So if I add three zeros to the eight, I get 11. Okay, well, there's something called a light year, one light year, which is the distance light travels in one year. You might recall this formula. If you don't, it's no big deal because I can show you a neat way of dealing with it. All you have to do is think about your speedometer. Uh, anybody know what the units are on your speedometer? Miles an it's hour. Also yeah, miles per hour. And mile is a unit of? Distance. Distance. And hour is a unit of? Time. And per in mathematics, yeah, some people make a mistake with this one, but it, 
means anybody know? Division. Division. So what you know there is velocity, which is the same thing as speed for us. We'll we'll discuss the differences later. Is equal to distance divided by time. Sorry, distance is equal to velocity times time. Whenever you have an equation like this, where one thing is equal to a product of things, you can take the single thing and stick it up top, and you can take the other two products and stick it under it. So if I want to know velocity, I cover that up, and that says, oh, you just divide the distance by time. See how I did that? Also, if you want to know the time, you cover time up, and you say, oh, I must divide the distance by velocity. And as long as you have similar units, like miles per hour and then miles for the distance, it works. Uh, finally, if you want to know the distance, you cover that up. That looks like you're multiplying velocity times time. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply velocity times time to get a light year. Well, a light year is the distance light travels in one year. I happen to know that the speed of light is 299,792,000 458 meters per second. And if you multiply this first by uh, by 3,600, that'll uh, switch your uh, seconds to actually hours. And then you multiply it by 24, that'll switch it to days. And then you multiply it by 365, that'll switch it to years. It turns out that is approximately, so I'll put this little square uh, squiggly thing to show it's approximately equal to pi 3.14 times 10 to the seventh seconds. So again, that just comes from multiplying 3,600, which is the number of seconds in, a, in an hour. It's 60 times 60, 60 seconds in a minute and then 60 minutes in an hour. So 60 times 60 gives you 3,600. Multiply that by 24 to get the number of hours in a day. Multiply that by 365 to get the number of days in a year. Uh, so now you have a light year is the product of these two numbers. Uh, when you actually do that, you can uh, do a quick calculation. I'm going to use my calculator. And actually, it's not technically 3.14. If I remember correctly, it's 3.16, but we roughly estimated as 3.14, and that gets plenty. So I'm going to say 299792458 times 3.14 EE. The, every calculator, every scientific calculator, We'll have like an EE button, like this one right here that I'm pointing at. Or it'll have this, in which case you go, you hit the multiply button and you say 10 to the, and then you type in the actual seven that I'm getting ready to put there. Here, I just hit the EE button and then go uh, type in a seven. And when I do that, it gives me an answer equal to 9.4 one times 10 to the 15th meters. So that's what a light year is, is 9.41 times 10 to the 15th meters. If you wanted to see how many uh, astronomical units that is, this is another thing that you might need to do in, in occasionally on your homework, but not on your test, is be able to convert units. So if I said uh, one light year is equal to 9.41 times 10 to the 15th meters and I wanted to count, uh, turn that into astronomical units, I first off realized that this is just a number, therefore I can put it over one so it's clear to me uh, whether the 9.41 is in the numerator or the no denominator. Now to convert units, I can only do one thing and that thing is I can only multiply by one. If I multiply by anything other than one, I'm changing its value, right? That's the only thing you can multiply a number by. But one can be written in a lot of smart ways. One can be pi over pi, or it could be 12 inches over one foot, or it can be one foot over 12 inches. All of those are one because the top number is equal to the bottom number. So I have a statement right here that tells me exactly what an astronomical unit is. So I can put this on the top, and this on the bottom, and that's a value of one, or I can do it in reverse. In this case, I want to get rid of the meters. So just like when you multiply 3x by 4 over 2x, the x's cancel out, right? 
Well, the same thing happens with units because units are just multiplied by their numbers. So if I put the meter down here in the bottom, that would be 1.4. Uh, 9, 6 times 10 to the 11 meters. And then I put the other number on top, that'd be one astronomical unit. Now let me write it in black because that's confusing with that one there. So you see what happens now is this meter down here disappears by canceling out the one up there and all you're left is a, a AU in the top, which is exactly what we want. So now I can tell how many light years or how many astronomical units are in a light year. So I'm gonna divide, notice this one's on top. The way you work something like this, no matter how long it is, is you multiply all the numerators, that's your new numerator. Then you multiply all the denominators, that's your new denominator. And then you divide your numerator by your denominator. So in this case, you're gonna say 9.41 times 10 to the fifth the only unit left is the AU over 1.496 times 10 to the 11th. Oh, that was 10 to the 15th, by the way. Oof, that would have been bad. 10 to the 11th. Uh, and that's the total answer. So now what I'm going to do is turn my calculator back on because my long-windedness made me let it turn off. So I'm going to divide that 9.41 times 10 to the 15th. I'm going to divide that by 1.496 e to the 11th, and lo and behold, I get 62 times 10 to the third uh, AU. So basically one light year is 62,000 astronomical units. So that slide showed us the Oort cloud goes from 2,000 to 200,000 astronomical units. So it actually is larger than a light year. OK, I'm not making you memorize all this stuff. OK, not at all. You on occasion will run into homework problems that might uh, give you something in AU and ask you how many light years it is or vice versa. I'm just showing you that in case you run into that problem. I tried to get rid of most of them, but occasionally one will pop up. OK, and I'm going to take a photograph of this page, too, and it'll be on my Google Docs so you can actually uh, check it out. I'll put a link to my Google Docs as well. So let me go back to sharing my screen. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I go on? Um, is that a, is it 62 times 10 to the second third. or the seventh? That's times the 10 third? to the third. Okay. So it's 62,000. Notice I didn't really use true scientific notation there. I just said 62 instead of 6.2. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that engineers do. They always have powers of, of three, six, nine, that sort of stuff. Never powers of one, two, four or anything. And then with the, uh, with the equation for the light year or the, the speed of light, um, what are the units for um, those two in the parentheses? Okay, so that's meters per second. It looks like a meter slash J. <laughs> okay. it's meters per second. That's the speed of light units. And this one's just a second. Okay, thank you. No problem. Good question. So you guys are following me really well. Okay, again, this is not what our class is about. This is not going to be a mathematical class. I just want to remind you guys, this is the cool class that everybody likes to take because, you know, it's awesome. So we're now back to where we were. Uh, we're out at the Oort cloud. Remember I said the Oort cloud goes from 2000 to about 200,000 astronomical units. 62,000 AU is a light year. So this is literally on the order of three light years across. Well, that's neat because at seven jumps where 10,000 astronomical units are roughly three light years across and it's still not seeing another star, okay? All of that that's in there are non-stars. They might be failed stars, what we call red dwarfs or brown dwarfs. Uh, they might be uh, things that are dwarf planets. There might be, then there's also planets, of course, but there's dwarf planets and that's it. There's no other star in that area because the closest star to us, to us is either Alpha or Proxima Centauri in the constellation Centaurus, and that's 4.3 light years away. So at seven jumps, we haven't gone, but about three light years across. So let me take another jump. Uh, let me first click the button over here so y'all can see the jump. Okay, so now that I jumped an eighth jump, that's eight jumps of 100. Now I'm looking at an area that's about 1 million astronomical units across and above. In that area, we can actually see what we call our solar neighborhood. So 
uh, we finally got another line on our uh, envelope after the uh, star system called solar, solar system, the next line would be the stellar neighborhood. So you could say our solar neighborhood or just the stellar neighborhood. And it's a few dozen, uh, on the order of about a dozen stars. There's Bernard star, there's Alpha Centauri which and Proxima Centauri, which are closest to us. There's Sirius, which is fairly close to us. Uh, Y'all might know it from Harry Potter. Uh, he's named after a star. In fact, the, the brightest star in the night sky. There's Procyon, that's actually a star in Gemini. There's Epsilon Iridani, a Tau Ceti, Bernard Star Altair, which is in uh, Aquila in the Summer Triangle. That's uh, Ada Cassiopeia, that's in the Upside Down House looking thing, Ross and Wolf. You don't have to memorize any of those stars, okay? Mm -hmm. Not at all. I just uh, given is, you an idea of what is we're that seeing. called the local fluff or the local uh, bubble? It's a, local it's the local uh neighborhood our solar neighborhood or uh, stellar neighborhood so, same as the local cluster right yeah the, yeah the local cluster though is galaxies oh yeah, so, yeah okay. so that's why so, i'm trying to use words like neighborhood but i've heard it called local fluff i, I hadn't heard that before that's kind of neat and and uh, to be honest with you i am not the cool kid or the cool kid that I wished I was who was studying astronomy from a young age. I didn't get interested in it until I got to college. It just also, as I told you, I'm local a fluff kid. to local bubble, and then it went to Orion's arm. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Well, y'all are certainly okay with using that. I just hadn't heard that terminology cool. before. Cool. I Thanks. just usually call it the solar neighborhood. So look out for that word, like in multiple choice questions and stuff. Okay. Cool. But yeah, fluff. I like that. <laughs> so if I jump at ninth time, now I'm looking 100 times larger than the thing I was looking at. And in fact, you can see that's about 1,700 light years. This is roughly all the stars you see with your naked eye. That's something that most people don't understand. People don't understand that all the stars you see, which is only order of about six or 7,000, depending on your eyesight uh, and how dark of an area you're in, they're all within a small bubble in the outskirts of our galaxy. We're not even looking at other galaxies. We're not looking at stars in other galaxies at all. So that's kind of amazing. Uh, again, we're on this, we're seeing on the order of 5,000 to 7,000 stars in that 1700 light year uh, sphere ra radius, or I should say diameter sphere. And that is our extended solar neighborhood. So that's another line on the envelope if you really wanted to. Again, you could write solar neighborhood or solar fluff and then you could write extended solar neighborhood and probably extended solar fluff if you'd like. <laughs> okay. The next one, we jump up to a 10th. Now it's cool enough that we actually got our galaxy in there. Now our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. We were at 1700. So now we're looking at 170,000 light years across. So that's more than enough to fit in our Milky Way galaxy. This is obviously not our Milky Way galaxy. It's sort of like if you were a blueberry and a blueberry pancake, you'd be hard pressed to try to take a photograph of the pancake while staying in the pancake. And we haven't left the pancake. So we're, we don't have photos like this of our galaxy, but we've mapped it out and we know it's a barred spiral. This one has somewhat of a bar. There's a bar looking thing right here roughly. And then the spirals come off of it, but it's probably not that accurate. Uh, of a representation of what our galaxy looks like. I'll show you a drawing that's more accurate. But it is important to know that it roughly puts our uh, extended solar neighborhood in the right place. It's a little more than halfway out from the center. So the, ga the galaxy is 100,000 light years, halfway, uh, the, the radius would be half of that, that's 50. So you're saying about 25 uh, would be half. So about 27, 28, thousand light years from the center of our galaxy is where we are. Okay, so this picture accurately represents where we'd be in it. But just remember, it's only 100,000 light years out and we're somewhere between 27 and 30 light years from the center. I do some more speculation. There's a more drastic barred spiral. So you can really see the bar in that case. Right. But here's probably the best representation of what our galaxy really looks like. And this is an artist drawing instead of a photograph. So you can see it's a, a, a bar with several arms coming off of it as opposed to just one. And again, the, our, our extended solar neighborhood is a little bit more than halfway out. So that's helpful to know, okay? 
So if we take an 11th jump, now we're in our local group or, or you might even call it our local cluster. It's not quite a cluster yet though, to be officially correct. This is just a group. And a group or a cluster is really a number of galaxies that are all gravitationally interacting. So ours has two major, our local group has two major galaxies. That's the uh, Milky Way, which in Greek was Galactos Wea. They literally pictured this as this mythological story where uh, a woman's uh, breast squirted milk across the sky and that made our Milky Way. It was literally considered the Galactos Wea, meaning the, the way of the milk or the milk way. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a neat thing. Maybe got, everything has to do with sexual organs and mythology. So uh, all the creation of matter and all that stuff came from you know, boobs and, and schmickies and whatnot. So <laughs> just be prepared for that when you read mythology. But at this 11th jump, we're now at 17 million light years. Uh, we don't really use a, a bigger unit that's a base unit, uh, but we might jump to mega light years because mega is the same thing as the prefix for a million uh, and mega parsec because a parsec turns out to be 3.26 light years. So just keep that number in mind, maybe write it down 3.26 parsec, or excuse me, one parsec is 3.26 light years. So uh, we'll use parsecs and mega light years or millions of light years uh, and mega parsecs, which is millions of parsecs uh, for this area. But it has two major galaxies. Like I said, Milky Way is one of them. Anybody know the name of the other one? Andromeda. Andromeda. And in fact, Andromeda is 2.5 million light years away from us. So it's time now to, to confront the problem of the light year, okay? Light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, is extremely fast. It travels at 186,000 miles every second. That's fast, right? 186,000 miles every second means it can go more than seven trips around our equator in a single second more than seven trips around our equator in a single second. It can more, uh, it can almost make it from the moon to the earth in a single second. But still, even being that fast, it takes about eight minutes for it to get from our sun to us. If our sun burn out, for instance, the first thing we would see is a black spot in the middle because that part, the middle part of the sun is closest to us. And then that black spot would slowly propagate outwards uh, and we would be on an eight minute delay. We wouldn't see it, of course, until eight minutes later, a little bit less than eight minutes for that front little dot. And that's the nature of the light year. Light can't travel any faster than that. So when I say the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away, we're seeing it as it looked 2.5 million years ago. Uh, that is when we're just starting to get creatures experimenting with walking upright, if I remember correctly. Again, that's not my area of science, but that's roughly what I remember. Please, if you're a, a biologist, evolutionary biologist, or know something like that, uh, and you know I'm off a little bit, let me know. But I, I, I think the last I checked was we thought on the order of a million years ago was when people are pre-humans were trying to stand upright and walk on occasion. 100,000 years uh, to 500,000 years, I think, is when we got Homo erectus and Neanderthalus and those sort of things. So at our 11th jump, we're actually seeing the local group. It has those two major galaxies, and then it has on the order of a couple dozen smaller ones, Sagittarius A, Sagittarius B, so on and so forth. If we jump a, another factor of 100, uh, oddly enough, we're now in the large, well, first you'd probably see uh, if you slowly did it, instead of just jumping to 100, uh, you would see the Lanakia uh, supercluster. You would see a cluster first, uh, which is uh, the Virgo cluster, and that's what we're in. So that's another line on your envelope is the Virgo cluster. And then the Virgo cluster is part of a supercluster uh, called the Lanakia supercluster. Gotcha. And as part of your Lanakia supercluster, uh, and the Lanakia supercluster is this little vein on these, uh, these things that you see in this picture. So these things, if they're more than just a, a filament, which is what a one-dimensional string of galaxies would be, then they're two-dimensional, in which case they're called a wall. And then if they're one-dimensional, they're called a filament. And then these open spots between walls are called voids. Those are the largest things in the universe, uh, walls, filaments 
and voids. They're on the orders of millions of millions of parsecs, okay? Now, here's the deal. The universe is that. I mean, that's a picture of the large-scale structure of the universe. When a cosmologist is studying cosmology, they're uh, generally working on it on this dimension where a single galaxy, remember 100,000 light years across is our galaxy. A single galaxy is a point particle for a cos cosmologist. So that's what cosmologists study. But what I need you to understand is that the universe is not just the space with all the stars in it. The universe is the space itself including everything that's in it. So it's all of the matter, all of the energy, all of the dark matter, which makes up about 27% of, of the matter, and all of the dark energy, which it makes up about 98%. And it appears that the matter that we're used to is only on the order of five to 2%. Two to 5% is the regular matter that we're used to. But all of that stuff, including the space itself, is the universe. And the reason why I reiterate that is I want you to understand. I'm going to kill this for a second. And I'm going to go to my camera camera. Oh, nope. I'm just going to stop the video because I'm going to retard. Sorry, that's an offensive word. I should not have used that because I'm a goober. Okay. So I am not going to stop the thing. I'm just going to turn on my webcam and look at me again. So, uh, we as physicists and astronomers say that the universe was created in the Big Bang. Okay. What we mean by that is the universe, the whole thing I just finished telling you existing is what came into existence from the Big Bang. This is not saying like most people think that space is just, you know, the universe is this empty void. And then the Big Bang happened some point in space where all the matter exploded out of that. If that was the case, then we could trace back the velocities of all the galaxies and they would all point to a single point. We don't see that at all. In fact, what Hubble discovered, it, is, discovered is when you go, uh, say, 100 parsecs away, uh, galaxies are moving at 70, uh, 70 kilometers per second. And if you go instead 200 kilometers or 200 megaparsecs away, they're going 140 kilometers per second. And at three, they're going 210 kilometers per second. Every one is running away from every other one. And that's not because they're moving through space. It's because space itself between them is expanding. So the Big Bang created the universe itself. It's not empty space where an explosion occurred. The space didn't exist either. If it doesn't confuse you, then you're not getting it. Okay, <laughs> that's what I mean by that. So the, the Big Bang created the space itself, and we don't think it's actually expanding into anything else. Uh, there may be other universes that helps us understand, although it's really a hy hypothetical that we can't test yet and maybe never be able to test. There might be other universes, and that would explain uh, why quantum mechanics does what it does, which we'll learn about later, but we just don't know that yet. Okay. So the universe, when it was created in the Big Bang, that created the space itself, and that space is expanding. So if you imagine taking a balloon and blowing up just a little bit, but not tying it, just pinching it, and then drawing a little array of galaxies, one, then go over a centimeter, one, go over a centimeter, one, go over a centimeter, do like six in a line, and then come down and do another line about a centimeter away, blah, 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 and then another line about a centimeter away, doing about six of those. Uh, you can take yourself to be the center one, and then what you want to do is measure your distance to from the center one to the one on your left, to the one to the left of it, to the one to the left of it, and then blow it up. Okay, blow the, the uh, balloon up. And what you'll see is now that first balloon might be, I mean, that first galaxy to your left instead of one centimeter might be two centimeters. And that second galaxy to the left is now going to be four centimeters away. And if you assume that happened over, say, a year, then basically it, it moved at two centimeters per year, whereas the first one only moved at one centimeter per year. And none of those galaxies can deal or touch the middle of the balloon, right? They're on the surface of the balloon, and that's what we think space is like. So it's really a, a amazing but confusing thing. All right, now let me go back to sharing my screen. We're almost finished. We've got only 10 more minutes left in class. So we're back here, and I want to tell you this cool story. So it turns out that's our universe, right? Uh, that's the concept of our galaxy. 
it turns out our galaxy, uh, we can measure how many stars are in it and it or any other galaxy by going out a certain distance from the center and uh, estimate or calculating how fast stars are orbiting it. The speed at which a star orbits the center of a galaxy tells us how much mass is within it. So if we do this on the outermost edge, we get an estimate of how massive or how much mass the star is or the galaxy has. And then by our statistics of stars, and we assume that every part of the universe is just like our part of the universe, we know that out of all the you know, 100 billion ma solar masses of stars, you know, 80% of them say are one solar mass and 12% are five solar masses or stuff like that. If we apply that to the individual galaxy whose mass we know, we can tell how many stars uh, in principle there are in our galaxy or in that galaxy. In our case, when we did that, we turned out, it turned out that our star or our galaxy has a hundred billion. That's one followed by 11 zeros. It has a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. That's a big number, okay? But it's done by that mass calculation, right? Now, if you wanna know how big this uh, number is, you can think about counting it. Let's think about counting it at a rate of one per second. So we go one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. Anybody wanna ponder a guess at how long it would take us to count to 100 billion? Do you think it would be days and then we assume we're not sleeping or eating or stopping or anything like that we're just continuously doing it because we're superheroes so do you think it would take days do you think it take weeks do you think it take months or do you think it take years or or more doesn't it take several lifetimes yes it in fact it takes three thousand five hundred years continuously counting like that to count to 100 billion so that's how many stars there are in our galaxy okay and drama is about the same size. Maybe we're 300 million, maybe a drama that might be 400 or 600 billion, but they're about the same, okay? So that's how many stars there are in a galaxy. Now, here's a cool thing. Uh, the Hubble deep field photograph is one of the coolest photographs ever. What they did is they found the deepest, darkest spot in space and turned Hubble towards it. And they had to do it above our North Pole or the Earth's South Pole or else the, the Earth would, uh, stop the image for a little while. So they picked a really black spot near uh, the Mil or near the Big Dipper. And they chose a spot that looked like it was 100% black, like there was nothing in it. And they, they looked at an area 2.55 by 2.57 arc minutes. Now, uh, a degree is one degree. That's a very small quantity. But if you take a degree and divide it by 60, that's an arc, an arc minute. If you take it again, the arc minute and divide it into 60 equal pieces, that's an arc second. So that's what we're talking about by arc minutes, a 60th of a degree. So this is 2.55 60ths of a degree by 2.57 60ths of a degree. So it's a really teeny area. Uh, you can imagine me standing on the, uh, the, what is it? The Atlantic Avenue in Virginia Beach and looking through my wedding band on the end of the pier that's about how big of an area of the sky we're looking at with Hubble, okay? So imagine a wedding band at the end of the pier and we're standing on Atlantic Street or Atlantic Avenue at the waterfront and looking through a hole as small as a wedding band, that's about how small of an area Hubble was looking. And it took this picture. It, it literally had to keep the aperture of the camera open for 11 days. So it's 11 days worth of photos here. They just left it open. Everything you see in there that doesn't have a little X on it, like that guy, all those little X's are individual stars. So there's a star there. Uh, let's see, let's move around a little bit more. Uh, I know I saw like four of them in here earlier. I'm not seeing them now. There's a little one right there. You can tell there's a star there as well. Everything else you're seeing, though, is got our actual galaxies. So if you count the number of galaxies you see in this field of view and then find how many wedding rings at that distance away that I just told you from Atlantic Avenue to the end of the pier would take to encompass you as a sphere and you multiply the number of galaxies in that photo by the number of rings it would take, then you get the total number of galaxies in the observable universe. 
and we've done this over and over with several photos and we always come about to the same number. It turns out that just like the number of stars in our galaxy, there's about the same number of galaxies in the observable universe. And we think the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago. So the observable universe really is a sphere with us at its center, but with a radius of 13.8 billion light years. So that sphere is our observable universe. It doesn't mean it ends there. It just means that's the only area where time, uh, light has had enough time to get to us. And in that area, there seems to be one with 11 zeros after it star, or excuse me, galaxies in the observable universe. And if we make the assumption, which is accurate, that most galaxies are like ours and have 10 to the 11th stars, that would mean there's 10 to the 11th times 10 to the 11th stars in the observable universe. That's one followed by 22 zeros. One followed by 22 zeros is the number of stars in the observable universe. Well, how big is that? Well, we already know one with 11 zeros takes us 3,500 years uh, to count. So we can't really do that, but it turns out there is a nice, neat way to figure out how big 10 to the 22 is. I've done this calculation. You can do it on your own. It's not something I require my students to do. It's a little more mathematical, even though it just takes a little geometry and some Google searches. It turns out that if you take all the beaches on planet Earth and you estimate that the height of this berm line is maybe one meter taller uh, than the water line. And that this is basically a hundred meters from the water line to the actual uh, sand dune line. So you assume that's how big all beaches are. You know, a lot of them are a lot bigger and some of them are a lot smaller, but you take all those beaches on planet earth, uh, find out the number of dry grains of sand in that little one meter by hundred meter triangle that I just discussed and then multiply that by a mile to get the total number of uh, sand grains, dry grains of sand per mile of beach. And you multiply that by the number of miles of beach on planet earth. And lo and behold, you get roughly one with 22 zeros after it. So the number of stars in the observable universe is about the same as the number of uh, dry grains of sand on planet earth. Now check this out. This, that, that is amazing. That number stumps me and that gets me excited every semester, but this next part kills me. How do you think that number, one with 22 zeros on it, how do you think that compares to the number of atoms or molecules in that bottle of water that you see right there? Do you think it's uh, way more than the number of atoms or molecules in that bottle? Or do you think it's about the same? Or do you think it's way less? Less. Yes, it turns out it's about a hundred times less. There's about a hundred more atoms in that. Uh, well, I think this one's a 500 milliliter bottle. It might be a 300 milliliter bottle, but in a, a 500 milliliter bottle, there's about a hundred times more atoms in it than there are stars in the observable universe. So for every dry grain of sand on planet earth or for every star in the observable universe, there's a hundred atoms in that bottle of water. Isn't that amazing? How freaking small are atoms? You know, remember those uh, in, in grade school when they said the period at the end of the sentence, you'd have to lay a million atoms next to each other to span the rate, the diameter of that period. So now we're getting another estimate of how small atoms are and how amazing the universe is. The, the universe 13.8 billion light years across uh, excuse me, as a radius, there's my uh, sources, by the way. So uh, the universe is this sphere whose radius is 13.8 billion light years across. It has one with 22 zeros after it, stars in that observable universe, one with 11 zeros after it, galaxies in that observable universe. And that's still that little cup of water, that little bottle of water has a hundred times more atoms in it than we have stars in the observable universe. That's friggin' awesome. So I, I, that's the end of the talk. I think that gives you a, a good uh, idea of how to fill out the envelope, how to think about what galaxies are, what clusters are, uh, what a universe is as opposed to just a galaxy. Uh, remember those lines ended up with the, uh, the local cluster 
or the local group of galaxies, if you will, and then the Virgo cluster, and then the Linakia supercluster, your book will mention. And then uh, it's the uh, large scale structure of the universe that cosmologists study is the biggest thing. So uh, you would say universe would be the bottom line of your envelope. Uh, if there are other galaxies, they might have a, another line that would, or a line that instead of saying universe to say, uh, blah, 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 blah. Because obviously they're not going to come up with the same language we will. So they're going to even, might not even have sounds that make sense to us. Might even be some, you know, etched mind thing that they're sending through space waves or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> so anyways, that completes our uh, lecture for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I think that was, that's the funnest lecture I do every semester and I do it twice, just about every semester and I love it. Uh, I hope y'all got a lot out of it. And uh, if you don't have any questions, you are free to go. You, you, we do not have labs on Wednesdays. We only have them on Mondays. Uh, the lab for Monday, remember, was watching uh, Beyond the Big Bang. And you're going to answer those questions and turn those in at that site on Canvas. Uh, I did figure out the way to do roll through Zoom so you don't have to email me your name or anything. It not only tells me whether you were here, it tells me what time you got here and what time you left and how long you spent in it. Uh, and if you look at our syllabus, you're getting points for each time you come. So that's how I'm keeping track of that. So anybody have any questions? Uh, professor, this is yeah. uh, Zach. So I just experienced a disconnect with Zoom and I, thought I, heard that, I just yeah. wanted to let you know, I came back, it brought me back, I just, Wanted to double check if that would show up. In the yeah, it'll show up. Don't worry. Uh, okay. And don't worry about what you missed. This this video will be – actually, I've already got a version of it that I don't think is quite as good that's up on your Canvas page now. But this will be posted on Canvas probably within a few hours, and uh, you can go back and see whatever you missed. Yeah, I also experienced the same disconnect, and I was worried that it was my internet. But I had the PowerPoint up in another tab, and it was running and loading just fine. So I guess it was hmm. just Zoom. Yeah, it might have been Zoom. It might have been my, my side even. Uh, that's going to be weird because that might actually screw up our recording. Uh, but either way, you've got another one as a backup, so that should work. Uh, if anybody doesn't have any questions, you're free to go because I've got everything. I'm going to wait for the last person to leave before I close the meeting uh, so that everybody can ask questions. Feel free to ask as deep and detailed mathematical questions as you want, questions about the syllabus or anything whatsoever. So go ahead and uh, I will see you guys Monday if y'all don't have any questions. Otherwise, I can't wait to talk to you after class. Um, Bye. The only Thanks other coming, bye -bye. the only other question I have is on the math that we did today. Uh -huh. um, what exactly is is that math like considered? Like, what is it called? Uh, it's scientific notation. Scientific notation. I was uh, like blanking out entirely. <laughs> yeah. I, I wrote it down and I can't read what I wrote. And I was like, I'm rewriting it right now. So yeah. some lower level books also call it powers of 10 notation. So that might be it. And the other part is uh, unit conversion. And then unit conversion. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, by the way, one thing that will come up, like one of the questions they always ask is they say it takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth and the sun is one astronomical unit uh, away. If planet Q or whatever is 20 light years, or excuse me, 20 astronomical units away, how long does it take light to get there? So in that case, that's the type of problem where you're just going to use a, a simple proportion uh, to make sense of it. So you'd say uh, eight minutes is to one. So eight over one equals 20 like uh, 20 astronomical units over question mark and then you cross multiply and divide by what's multiplied by the under uh, the unknown and that'll give you the time in minutes but they'll normally ask for it in like hours so you then have to divide by 60 to make it minutes or divide by 60 again to make it hours that's about the only other type of math that you do and i gave you that a little bit by showing you the circle with d equals d over t on it or b times t on it all right thank you no problem see you rosie Peyton, Melvin. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, for the stuff for the lab, were you posting that in the same like uh, Canvas portal? As yeah, I'm going to keep class? it all on the same Canvas board for lab and lecture. Okay, so I um, because I have lab with a different instructor oh, instructor yeah. 
Darn it. Okay. I meant to mention that to you guys today. I'll send out an email about this, but if you are interested, I, I can talk to all the instructors. If, if the time works for you, or if you'd still rather be in my lab, but you can't make the time, I'm willing to let you uh, be in my lab and not the other student, uh, not the other instructors. Uh, and you don't even have to attend long as you watch the videos uh, that I post and do the work that I post. Uh, but yeah. if it fits your schedule, you can also just switch to it. So just, you know, if you, if you want to do any of that, let me know. It shouldn't matter. All our teachers, especially our astronomy teachers, love teaching and they're awesome. So Yeah, I, I would like to do that. Yeah, it's just the scheduling because I usually work like afternoons on Mondays. Gotcha. So I wouldn't be able to come because I go from class like straight to work. No problem. I, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I let everybody know. I'm going to send out an email so everybody can get that uh, information. But you're not required to. It's cool. And like I said, all the instructors here, we, we love teaching. So they, they should be really good no matter who you have. Okay. 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 Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Um, how do some, how will the Astro Points work this semester? Um, I took Braun um, mm -hmm. a couple semesters ago. Right. And so he had stuff like, you know, going to planetariums. I see like one going to like an observatory in West Virginia. How will that work like with like COVID and stuff? Uh, if you look at my syllabus, it requires all of those things just require you to do a 200 word write up and mm. turn that in. I want that turned in in PDF form, though, not Word, because Word has often has viruses and PDFs don't. Uh, so anything you want to turn in as a uh, Astro Point thing, you can do it that way by uh, writing the thing and, in Word and then saving as a PDF and then uh, uploading it. I'll have a window uh, or excuse me, a module where you can turn in uh, actual Astro Points and each of the Astro Points listed will have an assignment tab in that module. Okay. Okay, and uh, you'll look at his his list and my list are very similar, so you should find a lot of the same things in there. Uh, in fact, I'm also going to have and I think I forgot to put it in the syllabus uh, that I made uh, at play at the cosmos is a game that comes with this and you're probably going to get if I remember correctly 20 or 50 points for every mission you complete there. Okay, yeah, that, okay. Sounds, that sounds good. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. You too.